Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. John White. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD. People always say to me, Dr. White, who do you follow on social media? Dr. Eric Topol. That's the person I follow. If you want to know anything about health tech or health services research, his profile needs to be in your feed. And he is my guest today. Dr. Topol, thanks for joining me. Oh, gosh, it's always a privilege, John. Thank you for having me with you. I love your Twitter feed, and I'm going to focus a little on it today to help put in perspective some of the aspects of AI. And you posted an article, an editorial perspective from the New England Journal of Medicine. And I love the title. It says, is medicine ready for AI? So that's my first question to you, Eric. Is medicine ready for AI? Well, John, this is a really important point because medicine, the medical community may not be ready, uh, but AI is ready for it. Um, that is, things are happening so fast. I mean, the velocity here is something like I've never seen before. You know, ChatGPT was released November 30th, GPT-4, March 14th. We're talking about weeks that, and we're still in the early going of this large language model. So the opportunities, the multitude of kind of rebooting things that we do in medicine is really pretty striking. But how do you feel about it? Are you excited about the prospects? Some people will say they're scared about it. You know, in medicine, we tend not to be proactive. We tend to be reactive. So in many ways, I wanted to gauge your sense of where we are and where you are in terms of excited or fearful. Well, in the early phases, uh, I'm more fearful, skeptical, but I have confidence over time. It's something that we should be really excited about. That is, we're going to get the kinks out. We're going to get all of the validation and all the things that we need to do to get this, to have the right guardrails, mm -hmm. to have the right human in the loop oversight. And eventually, this is going to be extraordinary. The, the most important transformation of medicine in our time. But who's going to decide all of this, the guardrails, how it's used? And you pulled a quote that I'm going to use um, to kind of get your, your perspective. And you made it as a tweet. And, and you said, having AI as an assistant to the doctor is going to play to the strength of the doctor as an intellectual, compassionate provider of care. But what I want to ask you, Eric, you're talking about it as an assistant. Everyone's not talking about it as an assistant. Some people are talking about it as the AI doctor, mm -hmm. right? The AI mm -hmm. technology is going to diagnose your condition. Some people think it's in lieu of the doctor. So what's the right usage? Is it just an assistant? And is that kind of a physician-centric, you know, paternalistic viewpoint that people will argue versus consumers are saying, it's too hard to go find the doctor. This might be better. Right. Well, great question, John. Uh, the point here is that it depends on whether you're the patient or you're the doctor. So if you're the doctor, it provides a lot of assistance because instead of doing a Google search or up to date or whatever, you can get information uh, that, that's much better, that synthesizes everything we know. But also on any given patient, you could have their data, whether it's their images, their labs, their electronic records, their genome, all integrated. In addition, most importantly, in the near term, you could have all the clinical documentation done. So instead of having to uh, type at a keyboard, the voice speech during the visit or bedside rounds will be relearned how a doctor does that. So while I'm doing the physical exam, I would be talking about the findings instead of you know, hiding that from the patient because it has to get captured in, in the note that's made from the AI. So sure. that, not only that note, but the pre-authorization to insurance companies, discharge summaries, procedure operation notes, scheduling new appointments, next appointments, uh, setting up prescriptions, all this stuff will be automated. But do you think that's how most people are talking about it? In, in terms of helping some of those administrative tasks versus helping in deliberative decision-making. So 
helping in that tumor board assessment that we have in oncology in terms of what should be the precise treatment for a patient. And, and you know, people will argue and say, well, there's not transparency to these algorithms. They make mistakes. They have biases. Doctors make mistakes. We yeah. have biases that yeah. aren't always explicit. What, what exactly is going to be that function in the deliberative process? Where should it be, Eric, in helping us as clinicians make decisions? Well, I like the way you partition it, John, with the administrative versus the actual care of patients, key decision making. And the latter, the key decision making, there has to be the human in the loop. Uh, here we're talking about the doctor clinician. But the point is, is that the ability, the empowerment of patients to look things up, like now when you look things up, it's not about you. It's about whatever is known uh, about. And there's all these different hits and you got you could spend all day going through these, right? But what we're talking about in the future is your data, all of your data could be used to help screen to make a tentative diagnostic, let's say a differential, right? And then you would talk to the doctor about, you know what, what about this potential? Uh, and making the diagnosis accurately is going to be enhanced. Patients who are taking charge and are entering their data, provided we can deal with security and privacy sure. and bias like you bring up and all these things. Once we get our, our arms around these these, these troublesome aspects, it's going to be really um, important to promote patient autonomy. What's your feeling on chat GPT, these generative content um, tools where it's not going to be the same as search where you kind of type in, it's going to be a, a, a chat bot, right? I'm going to ask them the questions I might ask relating to me, you know, what should I do meeting these parameters to manage a disease? Are you excited by that? Fearful? about well, it? What's your thoughts? Well, chat GPT is, is the forerunner to GPT-4, and there's a big mm -hmm. gap in performance because chat GPT is pure text language only, which GPT-4 brings in all the video and the imagery. And, you know, it's, it's a totally enhanced um, input training. Now, I, I like chat GPT because it's fun. I mean, I'm having a conversation now instead of trying to do a search and you go through. I'm actually, I'm, I'm impressed of the fluency, the rapidity of the responses. And I'm also uh, impressed at the badness of some of the highly confident responses that are totally fabricated. Yeah. I mean, the large language model and particularly ChatGPT, we've seen lots of evidence because it's the fastest growing user base in history. Uh, of any technology. So people have identified this of this problem of getting the wrong results with confidence, right? That's not going to work in healthcare. You've got to have accurate. And you mentioned, I, I'm glad you mentioned it. Doctors do make mistakes and so will AI. So yeah. there are ways to do checkpoints even now, and it'll get better. Are we using tech in the right way when it comes to diagnosing health issues simply because we have a technology to do it, is that the best approach? And, and I say that in the context of another tweet where you have a headline from The Economist that says, an algorithm can diagnose a cold from changes in someone's voice. And I, I love your response, which I'm going to read. Your comment was, I think we can do this without an algorithm. Right. So I, I have to ask, are we sometimes getting it wrong? in terms of utilizing AI to diagnose some conditions? It's, it's, we get involved in the hype and the, and the technology? Yeah, I mean, I think it can get overcooked. I mean, in that particular example, I was in injecting some humor, sure. but what, that, what they're doing is when, the vo when a voice isn't changed that much that mm -hmm. you and I could detect it, and you're the employer, you could actually say, hmm, does this person really have a cold? And you could put the voice test to an algorithm. But this is kind of it's kind of silly stuff, really. We need we need AI to to help us with much more important matters than that. What do you think medicine will look like in two years? Will these tools, the use of more widespread AI, fundamentally change the way we interact with patients, or do you think it'll just be slightly iterative? 
Well, if we go in the usual path, which is slow-mo, there won't be a lot of perceptible changes. However, on the clinician side, the desperate situation of being data clerks is so bad that I think there's going to be rapid embracement. There's already many health systems around the country now that are piloting these tools to get rid of keyboards. So I think we're going to see that in the next year or two, uh, a very substantial proportion, probably still a minority, but yeah. still a substantial proportion will have um, automated notes that um, connect with patients, that do nudges with patients about, did you yeah. check your blood pressure? And then all the other things that basically free up doctors so they can spend more mm -hmm. time with patients on, on important matters rather than being um, slaves to uh, keyboards and screens. Well, as I said at the beginning, you are the person that I follow on social to learn about health tech, to learn about health services research, and our audience members should follow you as well if they're not already. Dr. Topol, thanks for taking the time today. Oh, you're very kind. Great to join you. Yeah.